Okay, well, thank you everyone for, for joining us today. Uh, I'm, my name is Eric Scott, and I'm the director of the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies at the University of Kansas. I'm really excited to uh, introduce uh, the first uh, speaker of our new fall series, Cold War Legacies, Russia, the United States, and the World. Uh, this series is going to explore how the Cold War helped make the contemporary world and continues to affect us both in terms of international politics, uh, the environment, popular culture, and foreign policy. Uh, our first speaker today is Sergei Radchenko. Uh, he'll be followed uh, by uh, environmental historian Kate Brown on October 14th, uh, sports scholar Bruce Berglund on November 4th, and former National Secu Security Council member Fiona Hill on December 8th. Uh, this series is supported by the U.S. Russia Foundation, and we're really grateful for their support. So our first speaker, our speaker uh, today, uh, Sergei Radchenko, is uh, the Wilson E. Schmidt Distinguished Professor at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Bologna, uh, formerly at Cardiff University in Wales. And he's actually presenting uh, from Wales uh, uh, rather late in the evening there. Uh, so we're grateful he could join us. Uh, Professor Radchenko is a native of Sakhalin Island in Russia. Uh, who has received his degrees from prestigious, prestigious institutions in the US, Hong Kong, and in London. And he is the author of several books and numerous articles on Sino-Soviet relations, Soviet and Chinese foreign policies, atomic diplomacy, and NATO expansion. He has served as a global fellow and a public policy fellow at the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, DC, and the Zi Jiang Distinguished Professor at East China Normal University in Shanghai. He's also a frequent contributor to the New York Times, the Washington Post, and foreign policy, and an even more prolific presence, I, I could say, on Twitter, where he posts about his historical research as well as its contemporary implications. So I encourage you to, to find him and follow him there. His talk today is entitled, Are We Living Through a New Cold War? Philosophical Reflections of a Cold War Historian. Uh, he'll speak for about 40 to 45 minutes, and then we'll take questions. But if you have questions at any time in the presentation, uh, feel free to enter them into the chat box and we'll get to them uh, when he finishes his remarks. All right, Sergey, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Eric. Thank you so much for uh, this very, very generous introduction. Of course, the, uh, you, you forgot to admit the very interesting fact in my bi biography that I spent two years in Kansas, uh, which I, I um, uh, admired greatly. We were just talking about my earlier experiences there, and I feel that it, it of course, would have been much better if I were present there in uh, person. This is how we planned it out originally, so I'm sorry it didn't really happen this way. What can we do? So many contingencies intervene. Uh, but nevertheless, I'm glad uh, to be here and to be talking about this very strange topic for me. Although I'm a Cold War historian, I should be very happy to talk about the Cold War. But in this particular instance, I'll tell you why I find it a little bit difficult. And that is I'm, I'm close to finishing a book and I'm trying to formulate sort of the big picture, try to understand the big picture, what this book is trying to, what story the book is trying to tell. It's a history of the Cold War. And as I was preparing for this talk, I tried to lay it out, even for myself, maybe for the first time, um, uh, to, to try to see this big picture. So I've, uh, I, I have my notes here, which I will try to follow, and we'll see whether this argument makes sense. So I'm very open to your critical uh, uh, remarks. Uh, about this project, especially that I have not yet written a conclusion or an introduction, which are both the most important part parts of the book. So the evidence is there, of course, I'm just trying to figure out what to make of it. So the big question for today, are we living through another Cold War? Uh, uh, generally speaking, um, historians hate bad analogies like this. Um, this is really for um, media pundits to say, oh, we're living in another, you know, another, in another Cold War, whereas historians will say, well, that's not the case at all. Of course not. And they will present you with a host of reasons, some more, some less convincing. For example, um, they might say that the Cold War, 1945, you might date it differently, 1945 to 1989. 
they might say was bipolar, whereas uh, today what we have in uh, the relationship between, let's say, the United States and Russia or the United States and, you know, and China is something else entirely. The bipolar world is not no longer there, so therefore, how can we speak of another Cold War? Obviously, it's something else. They might also say that the world of the Cold War was very disconnected. There were different systems. They were not interconnected they were among themselves, whereas today the world is much more closely interconnected. There's a very integrated world economy. Therefore, it's a very different beast, a very different thing altogether. Uh, so you cannot really speak of a repetition of the Cold War. Um, I'm not sure I'm convinced totally by this too. They are, you know, you can argue that after all, bipolarity was not such a persistent condition during the Cold War. Think about the Sino-Soviet split and what that did to our bipolar world from the 1960s onwards, or indeed uh, whether the bipolar framework really accounts for a phenomena like the non-aligned movement, which also became a powerful force in its own right. So I don't think it necessarily captures the complexity of the Cold War world, never mind of our own world. Um, one might argue also that during the Cold War, the world was actually economically quite connected. Think about, for example, the relationship between uh, the Soviet Union and the world oil market or the Soviet dependence on the American supply of grain in the 1970s. An economic dependence, you cannot say the Soviet Union was an autarkic system. It existed in its own world by itself without connection. It's just not the case. Uh, so I, I don't like those two reasons, but there's some other reasons why you might say that actually what we have today is not, is not even similar to the Cold War in any Way. So, for example, you could argue the Cold War reached to every corner of the globe. Uh, Art Arnie West had written about the global Cold War, uh, which is true, of course. But does, does that really mean that the Cold War dynamic was always the determinant, the, the key factor in conflicts like, let's say, the Indo-Pakistani partition or the... Uh, the Sino-Vietnamese War of 1979, where was the, the Cold War there? I'm sure you could probably connect to the Cold War. You can connect uh, Vietnam to the Soviet Union, etc. But the underlying dynamic of this seems so different from the dynamic of the Cold War that it, it seems that we should not really um, uh, make this connection necessarily. Now, uh, another interesting argument may be made uh, that the Cold War was characterized by nuclear confrontation. And this one I don't... You know, people would say, well, today we don't have nuclear confrontation. I say, well, excuse me, why not? In fact, the world had less fewer nuclear weapons in the 1950s than, it, or certainly you know, up until the end 19, oh, of the 1950s, than it does today. Uh, uh, Russia and the United States have massive nuclear arsenals still, and they're much more powerful and much more invulnerable than they were in uh, during the Cold War. So the nuclear dimension is still there, although we may have forgotten about it. Uh, finally, and this I think is where it really is the key issue, it's ideology. Historians who say that what we have now is very different from the Cold War will point to this and, and they will say, this is what the key difference is. They'll say that there were two incompatible systems that existed during the Cold War. They were incompatible and they were determined to destroy one another. You could not have them coexist. One or the other had to come out on top. There was ideological struggle between capitalism and communism. This is such a clear, such a fundamental fact about the Cold War that you can you cannot ignore that. And also you cannot say that we have something like this now. It's a very different sort of situation. I think this argument is actually quite convincing um, in, in many ways. Let me just explain how this argument is usually presented in the historiography. 
It is not that the U.S. ideology is seen as necessarily so hostile towards communism that it was going to absolutely go out there and destroy communism until nothing and it was ripped to pieces. But generally, it's presented the other way, that the communist system was so hostile towards the West, and it was also expansionist, it was aggressive, it was going to dominate the world. And, and this was a live or die struggle. It had to be stopped or the whole world would eventually succumb to communism. You know, and, and I may be sort of dumbing it down a little bit here, but if you go to, let's say, the NSC 68, this is exactly what it says. I, I actually uh, uh, wrote down, I was looking at NSC 68 today, and here's what it says, fundamental design of the Kremlin, the fundamental, it says, it's got a section there called the fundamental purpose of the United States. The United States has a purpose, but the Kremlin has a design. So the design of the Kremlin is the follows. The US as the principal center of power in the non-Soviet world and the bulk work of opposition to Soviet expansion is the principal enemy whose integrity and vitality must be subverted or destroyed by one means or another if the Kremlin is to achieve its fundamental design. So the United States integrity and vitality must, must, not should, not maybe, must be subverted or destroyed by one means or another if the Kremlin is to achieve its fundamental design. That's the that's the key premise of NSC 68. We know, you know, we know what it's all about right um and by the way it is in this connection that i wanted to show you this picture here of the article by your speaker on december 8th fiona hill the kremlin's strange victory how putin exploit exploits american dysfunction and fuels american decline and we have putin here i'm not going to discuss the article but i like this picture I like this picture a lot because you can see Putin holding the United States and holding a match to it, you know, hoping that the United States would burn down. Interesting. Is the same premise still there? And if so, have things really changed? Or is there some sort of parallel between the perception that the Kremlin was out to basically destroy the United States back in 1950 when NSC-68 was written, and that it's still out to destroy the United States and its vitality and integrity, maybe by different means. But it says here, by one means or another, you know, maybe by interfering in elections or by doing something like that, that it wants to destroy the United States. I mean, fundamental issue is still there. It's still trying to go after the United States in one way or another. But the funny thing is, you know, who can accuse Putin of being a communist? He's not a communist. So obviously, um, something is different, but there's something that is still the same. The fact that so much rhetoric overlaps between the Cold War and the post-Cold War should itself give us some food for thought. Why is that? Why is this happening? Is it because the media are clueless or are we overlooking something? So in my work on the Cold War, a book that I'm currently writing, I've been trying to deconstruct the prevailing narrative and to see what really drove Soviet and continues to drive Russian foreign policy behavior. What I'm doing is, and maybe you, if especially if you have children, maybe you don't have children, you're quite young for that. I have a child, I have two children, and we have this toy. It's called Gen Jenga. Isn't it pronounced it Jenga uh, Tower? I think that's what it's called, Jenga Tower. I was trying to ask my daughter today when she, that's how she explained it. But the purpose of this, I don't know if you've ever seen that, the purpose of this is you construct, it's, it's, it's got wooden blocks, and then you take out wooden blocks one by one, one by one, until the whole thing topples. I guess if you take it out from the wrong side, the whole thing comes down and you lose the game. So what I'm trying to do here, there are all these factors, there is, of course, historian, historians like multi-causality, uh, part of the reasons we like multi-causality is we can never figure out what's more important. That's why we say we just sort of say, okay, it's all multi-causality because otherwise it's impossible to figure out what's actually what the, the main the main reasons. But what I'm trying to what I'm trying to do is I'll, I'm trying to 
plug all those factors in and then I'm trying to take them out gradually just to see what still holds uh, without falling over, yeah? So I'll give you an example, um, Stalin. Stalin, of course, was a murderous tyrant who was known for, you know, he, he carried out vicious purges against his comrades. Here's the question. Did Stalin carry out murderous purges against his comrades because he was a communist? Or was it because he was a dark, paranoid personality? I mean, it could be both. But if you take out the dark personality out, the dark, paranoid personality, if you take that little block of wood out, then the whole structure comes down because just being a communist doesn't necessarily make you, just being a communist doesn't necessarily make you go out there and kill all your comrades especially if they're fellow communists. And what it doesn't make any sense. You have to have this other thing there is that the, Stalin was a maniac, you know, paranoid personality. And he was so afraid of those people around him. He had to have them, uh, had to have them killed. So obviously that is, that seems like a primary motivating factor. Um, there's nothing in communism per se that requires killing fellow communists. So with, as just a random example, but let's shift this to foreign policy behavior and see whether uh, Stalin was so hostile towards the West because he was a Marxist or whether he was so hostile towards the West because he was a realist. That is to say he was, he believed in power struggle. It's very difficult to dis disentangle those two because you can say it's actually both. You can say it's both. Yeah, you can be Marxist and believe in that there's an inherent contradiction with the West and that the West is out to basically destroy you. Or you can be actually Machia Machiavellian realist and you can also believe that the other side is after you, is, is trying to destroy you. Um, if he was a hostile because he was a Marxist, would expect a non-Marxist leader to be less hostile, but that doesn't necessarily happen. So for example, now with Putin, you can say that Putin is pretty hostile towards the West, towards the United States, but does that mean, um, uh, uh, does that mean he's a Marxist? Of course, he's not a Marxist. But you'll say, well, you don't have to be Marxist to be hostile towards the West. And that's exactly my point. It's possible to be hostile without being a Marxist, but that this whole, but this actually undercuts uh, the whole notion of an inevitable ideological conflict, which is what we find in NSC 68. Um, or rather, conflict may be inevitable just for different reasons, or may not have anything to do with Marxism, but maybe with just other fundamental, you know, maybe with a cohesion world view of world politics as the world is, you know, life in the world is, uh, is nasty, brutish and, and short. So there are complexities, there are these complexities, theoretical complexities that drive me crazy. Uh, we have set up a straw man ideology and ascribed to it explanatory power that it may be, just maybe, doesn't deserve. Okay, so let me ask a simple question. What, in my opinion, drove Soviet foreign policy behavior? To explain this, and I don't do this in the book, I just came up with this just literally tonight. Um, and like all good ideas, this is totally plagiarized. So uh, I will plagiarize from Maslow. You know, Maslow pyramid of needs, human needs. At the bottom of the pyramid, you have basic security like shelter basic security etc um and then as you build up the pyramid you've got the next level the next level uh help me out here is like love and esteem their psychological needs and their self-actualization at the very top so the idea is you cannot actually proceed unless you, you've got security foundation then you build up you build up you build up then you self-actualize at the very very top so that's the that's the muscle pyramid well you can construct a similar pyramid in relation to the Soviet Union or Russia, and I'm just using them, but actually can construct the same thing in relation to many other countries. At the bottom of the pyramid is the need for security. 
um, the Soviet fear of invasion, um, not unreasonable, as Kennan had written, not unreasonable fear of invasion by foreign countries. Um, and then when you assure your basic security needs, you go up above, and then what's above that? It's love and respect. Uh, fundamentally, what that means is it's recognition. You want to be recognized. And security and recognition translate into legitimacy. And this is what I would argue actually drives Soviet and Russian foreign policy. It's the quest for legitimacy. Soviet desire for legitimacy explains, I would contend, a lot in Soviet behavior, much more than we can glean, for example, from the NSC 68, with its uh, struggle of black and white, or indeed in Cannon's discussion of the opportunistic Kremlin impervious to the logic of reasons, reason but highly sensitive to the logic of force, as Cannon had written in, in, the, in the long telegram. Um, I don't think that this really is correct. Uh, what to illustrate that and to illustrate how legitimacy in some some ways was more important, let me use the most difficult example that I could use. And the most difficult example is of course Stalin, because you know, if you if I can demonstrate the truth of this with Stalin, I can demonstrate the truth of it with anyone, because everybody will everybody who followed Stalin was much better than Stalin. Stalin was this, you know, really um uh, person who was obviously quite evil and paranoid and insecure etc so but still he really valued this legitimacy and he really valued recognition how do we see that well the story some parts of the story are well known so for example we know about his meeting with churchill in october 1944 to divide europe into spheres of influence the percentages agreement he was he was determined to honor his side of the bargain uh, and this is seen for example in his failure to support greek communists uh, when the greek communists launched a revolution or civil war to try to uh, capture power in their country stalin simply refused to support them uh, why? Because Greece was assigned to the British sphere of influence in Stalin's imagination, Western sphere of influence. He was not going to meddle there. That's just one example. But there are lots of lots of similar examples. My favorite examples act all actually concern Asia. Studied this question in great detail. Uh, consider Xinjiang. In 1944-45, Xinjiang uh, was basically um, with Stalin's support, it was experiencing an uprising against Chinese rule. It was not just Stalin's political support or military support in forms of you know weapons and arms, but actually Soviet, the Soviets were actually fighting on the ground in Xinjiang. If you want to know more about it, check out uh, Jamil Hassan Li's recent book on, on, on the Soviet effort to meddle in Xinjiang in the 1930s and 40s. By 1945, the Soviet controls and in, in separatist control in northern Xinjiang was basically complete. Stalin could have actually separated Xinjiang from China. This was, by the, la by the way, the last opportunity, I think, for Xinjiang to be independent, if they ever wanted to be. But anyway, so this was, this was 1945. Then Stalin turns radically against the independence movement in Xinjiang and eventually has the leaders of this independence movement killed. Well, he, he flew them out in an airplane to negotiate, and the airplane crashed. We know how Stalin operated, and that's a story. Um, uh, but anyway, so he basically forces Xinjiang to go back to China and to uh, make it up with the Chinese government. And the question is, why does he do that? Well, why? He could have had independent Xinjiang and he could have bufferized North China if he wanted to. He doesn't do that. And the answer is traceable back to the Yalta Agreement, which set up spheres of influence between the Soviet Union and the United States and assured Stalin not just certain gains, more limited gains that he could have otherwise, but American recognition of those gains, which made them so much more legitimate. So in relation to China, Stalin also got certain gains, including basis rights in places like Dali and Port Arthur, which used to be Tsarist port, 
uh, in eastern China, independent Mongolia. So he got a lot. He got, you know, he got independent, or rather, he got uh, Japan to return Sakhalin and the Kuril Islands. So all of those things were really important to Stalin. But what's even more important is that the Americans are recognizing those things, FDR did, which gives Stalin's claims legitimacy. So he valued legitimate claims more than he valued illegitimate claims. You see, and Xinjiang was an illegitimate claim. So he basically surrendered Xinjiang in order to have uh, China on board. Uh, Chiang Kai-shek signed the Sino-Soviet Sino -Soviet Treaty of Alliance or agreed to the Sino-Soviet Treaty of Alliance by August 1945. Another thing that Stalin did was he sold out Mao Zedong. In August 1945, uh, rather as in the process of signing this Treaty of Alliance with Chiang Kai-shek, he promised Chiang Kai-shek that he would not support Mao Zedong and he kept to his side of the promise, to, to uh, his side of the bargain. He sent a telegram to Mao Zedong on August uh, 22nd, I believe, 1945, asking him to travel to Chongqing to negotiate a coalition government with Chiang Kai-shek. Mao Zedong thought it was outrageous. It felt, how can you sell out a fellow communist leader like this? You know, Mao Zedong was full of hopes for revolution, um, et cetera, et cetera, building communism in China. Here comes Comrade Stalin and says, no, you go and negotiate a coalition government. How is it even possible? So Mao complied. He had to. Uh, but that just shows Stalin's pragmatism. It also shows that Stalin valued the Yalta framework, which afforded a uh, framework afforded um, uh, Stalin the kind of recognition that he really wanted. Uh, right. Final example in Asia is the August 1945 Stalin's plan to invade Japan. Stalin actually planned to invade Hokkaido. It was not discussed with FDR and Yalta, but comes August 1945, the Soviet forces are poised to, to cross the Sea of Japan in land in Hokkaido. If this happened, you'd end up with North and South Japan, just as you ended up in North and South Korea. All Stalin wanted at this point was Truman's approval, and Truman refused to countenance this. He just refused, said, no, this, is, this was never discussed. We're not going to approve that, and Stalin backs off. And the question is, why does he back off? And there are two possibilities. First, he was afraid of the U.S. atomic might, because this is all happening after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Or second, which I think is more uh, justifiable and realistic, is that Stalin wanted to maintain the Yalta framework and maintain the legitimacy of his relationship, of his gains and his relation with Truman. All of that was very, very important. So um, the conclusion of this part of the talk is that Stalin did not necessarily seek to maximize his gains. What he wanted was to have his gains legitimized by the United States. So far, so good. But the nasty concept of recognition is difficult to pin down. For it raises two issues. First of all, recognition by who? And secondly, recognition as what? So let's deal with the first question. Recognition as what? It's pretty clear that the USSR wanted recognition as a great power, not just not just a great power, but one of the two greatest powers. I say one of the two, because even at the height of Soviet might and ambition, which I would argue would be in the sort of mid 1970s, the Soviets only just aspired to co-manage the world with the United States. A couple of anecdotes about this. Uh, when Richard Nixon went to Beijing in February 1972, uh, he had a reception where he had a little Mao Tai, people were making toast, he was drinking, and then he made a toast that really upset, it was a public toast, that really upset Brezhnev. He said that China and the United States hold the destiny of the world in their hands. This was Richard Nixon telling this to the Chinese. Of course, you know, this war, it's went all around the world, landed on Brezhnev's desk. He was really upset about it when Kissinger later traveled to Moscow. Brezhnev reproached him for the saying, how could Nixon ever say that? And Kissinger said, well, he had too much to drink. That's the reason he said that, et cetera, et cetera. Later in June 1973, Brezhnev went to the United States. And during one of the uh, dinners at the Western White House um, uh, uh, in San Clemente, California, uh, 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 Nixon made a toast to Brezhnev. It was a private toast. Just the Soviet interpreter was present. He said, actually, you know what? The Soviet Union and the United States hold the world, the destiny of the world in their hands. It was not public. It did not go around the world. 
but it ended up in the Soviet version of events. You won't find it in the US anywhere, in the US transcripts or anything. So it just shows, by the way, the importance of multi-archival research. It ended up in the Soviet version of events, received the classification of top secret, didn't matter. Brezhnev circulated it to his comrades to show that the United States recognized the Soviet Union as a partner with which it was going to decide the destiny of the world. This was so important, by the way, uh, today, Russia has no such ambition. I think that just shows that uh, the Russian leaders today are, uh, uh, they, they, they're recog they, they want to be recognized as one of the great powers, but certainly not the second great power, not like, no, not the superpower, not like uh, during the Cold War. So the Soviet Union, although they never had the ambition to become number one in this regard, they had the clear ambition to be one of the two, whereas now Russia doesn't have an ambition like that, nor even a possibility. So it just shows that the Russians are starting to reappraise their place in the world. I guess you could argue that the Chinese today have the ambition to become one of the two, although I would still argue that the Chinese are not certain that they can ever be the one, as it were. Uh, but they, you know, they still want this kind of recognition. So to return to the Soviet Union, not uh, uh, um, uh, the okay, the problem. This is where it becomes very problematic. Not only that the Soviet Union wanted to be recognized as um, a, a superpower, as one of the two, uh, but it also wanted to be recognized as the leader of the revolutionary world. And at this point, you say, wait, 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 wait a second. How can you even define the revolutionary world without ideology? Since, you know, I've sort of dispensed with ideology, the ideology doesn't matter. I say, well, no, no, no. If you say revolutionary world, ideology, which you push out of the door, is coming back through the window and say, I'm still here. And they say, yeah, fine, fine. And we still need to figure out the role of ideology, which is a little bit too complicated for the talk today. Uh, suffice it to say that, uh, that you could also define the you know, the idea of being a leader of the revolutionary world as a you know in 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 terms of sort of being the leader of a group of client states or something like that. So you don't always depend on ideology for this. Um, but anyway, so the four two forms of uh, recognition being recognized as the as a great power as a superpower and uh, being recognized as the leader of a revolutionary uh, world or, or the revolutionary world or the, or the communist world, they are actually mutually reinforcing and supportive. That is to say, what kind of superpower are you if you don't have any clients who defer to you? Also, what clients will ever cling to you if you're not a superpower? So those two things relate to one another. Uh, the recognizing audiences are different depending on what you are being recognized as. So, for example, from the Soviet perspective or the Russian perspective, only the United States could recognize the Soviet Union or Russia as a great power uh, or one of the two because the Russians themselves recognized the United States as the one. So it's only the United States could, could bestow this recognition. You, you know, uh, let's say let's say New Zealand. Not to say anything bad about New Zealand, lovely country, but you know the Soviets didn't care about what New Zealand recognizes the Soviet Union as because it's a small country far away. Whereas the United States is the superpower, so it's the American recognition that you crave, not anybody else's. From this respect, America is the audience. You want to be recognized by America as a great power. But with regard to revolutionary, being the leader of the revolutionary world, it's a little bit more complicated. So you want to be recognized by, let's say, you know, China, because they're also communist, or by Cuba, or by Angola, or some countries like that. They reckon they defer to you because you're a revolutionary authority. So that's those are the two kinds of recognition the Soviets wanted in their time. And by the way, you know, I'm, I'm focused on here on the on the Soviet Union, but you can also just you, you can also project that onto the United States. And you can also say that today, uh, the world, uh, um, the world's recognition of US leadership, uh, um, I mean, when we say that, that, that the U.S. recognizes a superpower, it's really it's, uh, it's uh, U.S. enemies that recognize that have to recognize it as a superpower. But when we say that the United States has been recognized as democratic leader of the world, then it's only fellow democracies that will recognize this. You know, Russia will never recognize the United States as a democratic leader of the world because it just doesn't like this idea. It doesn't buy into this narrative. So there are two, there are different audiences and different kinds of recognition 
and they work for both Russia, for China, for the United States. And this kind of recognition is very important for legitimacy. Now, I mean, it's even more important, at least the United States has, has an election. Yeah, democratic countries have elections where Russia and the Soviet Union never had elections. So for them, external recognition becomes so much more important because they don't have sources of internal legitimacy. That's another point that I think is very important to emphasize. So let's, uh, yeah, how much, um, Ezra, how much time do I have? I've been just rambling on and I don't, have, I don't have to see the watch. Um, you have about four minutes, four or five minutes until the 40 minute mark. Um... Uh, okay, well, fair enough. So I'll just give you a couple of more. I'm actually on page eight of my 10, no, nine of my 10, no, eight of my 10 pages of notes. Okay, so um, a couple of episodes from the Cold War that, that uh, uh, show the effect of this legitimacy and different types of recognition. Um, one of my favorite examples is the Paris summit in, uh, in 1960. Now, what happened there, there was a you know, summit in Paris where Nikita Khrushchev went, Eisenhower went there, um, and it was supposed to, it was like a, a, a new step after, the, um, uh, after Khrushchev's visit to the United States, which launched the spirit of Camp David, but it was kind of derailed by the fact that Gary Power's plane was shot down by the Soviets right ahead of the summit, and then Khrushchev went to Paris and court with Eisenhower and the whole thing fell apart and historians have long wondered what would have happened if Gary Powers did not fly his U-2 over the Soviet Union was not shot by uh, shot down by the Soviet Union would Khrushchev just go to Paris and end the Cold War well the answer to this is clearly no on the basis of uh, uh, the Soviet archival documents. Um, it's it's very clear that Khrushchev was worried by 1960 that he simply had nothing to give to Eisenhower. Uh, if he wanted to end the Cold War, he would have to make concessions that the Chinese would not forgive him for. And the Chinese and the Soviets were at the time having a quarrel and, and you know, this is eventually, eventually exploded as the Sino-Soviet split. So Khrushchev had different, Khrushchev had problems with his various allies. And because he wanted to be recognized as the center of revolutionary world, he could not make the concessions to Eisenhower, which were needed to be recognized as the partner of the United States, if you know what I mean. So this was doomed from the start. And the fact that Gary Powers uh, was shot down over the Soviet Union was uh, actually a godsend for the so for, for Khrushchev. He used that opportunity. Another example is uh, relates to the Cuban Missile Crisis and the, and the question historians have asked for 30 years now or even longer is why did Khrushchev send missiles to Cuba? Two explanations have been offered for that. One, uh, the Soviet Union felt uh, was, was had a strategic uh, vulnerability, so it wanted to use Cuba as a kind of a uh, platform in order to compensate for its lack of ICBMs. Uh, so it's the strategic argument. And then there's the other argument advanced mainly by Russian historians that Khrushchev, or in particular actually by Anastas Mikoyan's son, late Sergo Mikoyan, who's published extensively on this, that Khrushchev wanted to save Cuba, quote unquote, save Cuba from American invasion. So those are two key explanations. But one thing that these explanations don't actually uh, take into account is the question of why did Khrushchev want to save Cuba from American invasion? What's so important about Cuba? Okay, America invaded various places. Uh, you know, why is, it, why is it that he became so attached to Cuba? And the answer to this is because he was worried about Soviet credibility and what he would look like to the likes of China, who were accusing him of selling out the revolution, uh, selling out the revolutionary world. Therefore, he, I mean, he craved that recognition. He wanted to be recognized as the leader of the revolutionary world. Therefore, he wanted to avoid the American invasion of Cuba and the toppling of the Castro regime. That is how those, you know, how this question of legitimacy and recognition, how they all connect and actually affect policy. That's just another very brief example. So finally, uh, just before I finish, I just wanted to mention a couple of things. One I wanted to mention about Gorbachev uh, is because Gorbachev is generally seen as a great ex exception. And, uh, you know, people talk about how things change under Gorbachev. Gorbachev ended the Cold War uh, and so on and so forth. I don't see Gorbachev as much of an exception to this pattern. Gorbachev still wanted to be recognized. And indeed, uh, Gorb what Gorbachev knew when he became the general secretary in 1985 was that the Soviet Union had deep, profound problems and uh, it was isolated internationally for a variety of reasons. Gorbachev wanted to recapture initiative on the international stage. So 
he launched his appeal for nuclear disarmament, and he also launched this whole idea of perestroika and new thinking. Uh, the book under this name was published in 1987, Perestroika and New Thinking. If you get the original copy of this book, which was published in English, you will see that it has a subtitle. Subtitle is For Our Country and for the World. Perestroika and New Thinking for Our Country and for the World. What is this if not an, uh, the idea of you know, seizing kind of, or capturing world attention and world leadership? What Gorbachev was trying to do was he was trying to recapture um, uh, or having uh, or have himself and the Soviet Union recognized by the international community as a country that was able to overcome the Cold War. This is what he tried to do, but of course, it, it, the whole thing was derailed, didn't go the way he wanted. And uh, December um, uh, 1989, he met at Malta with uh, George Bush, Bush 41. And uh, in those conversations, he was trying to prove to Bush, if you read the transcript, it becomes very clear. Uh, you know, a lot of people focus on Malta saying that this is where the Cold War ended and they had such a good relationship. Actually, I see a lot of contradiction there because he um, tried to prove to Bush said, actually, we did not lose the Cold War. It's the Cold War itself that lost. The methods of the Cold War lost, but we stand for human rights and universal values. And Bush just did not, it did not register for Bush. For him, uh, America stood for freedom, you know? Uh, freedom won, therefore America won. And he interpreted the end of the Cold War as definitely America's victory, of course, although he did not dance on the wall, as he uh, liked to point out. Certainly by January 1992, he was actually saying, actually, you know, by God's grace, we won the Cold War. Uh, finally, and those, those are going to be my final, final comments. Um, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Yeltsin, to be, uh, Yeltsin wanted to be recognized as a partner of the United States, not just any partner, but a key partner of the United States. We can see that in his various interactions with Clinton. He, um, he was hoping that the United States would provide this place for Russia next to itself, as it were. Um, Anatolia Demishin, one of uh, key Russian diplomats at that time, noted that uh, Kozarev, the, uh, the Russian foreign minister, who was seen as very pro-Western, uh, said at one of the foreign minister meetings, said, we have to be very close to the United States because if we don't, there's going to be nothing left of our pretensions to greatness. So even under Yeltsin in the 1990s, under early Yeltsin, uh, Yeltsin himself and various Russian diplomats, uh, they were reaching out to the West in an effort to be recognized by the West and also accepted by the West. This is where they would draw their legitimacy, but they wanted a place of honor, as it were, a respectable place at the table, which they were not necessarily getting, uh, because they're, you know, the next thing that comes was, of course, NATO enlargement, and for uh, and NATO enlargement proved that that this narrative of some kind of a global partnership between Russia and the United States, post Cold War partnership, was just was just hot air. It was not; it had no basis in fact, but it spurred inside Russia. And I remember that very well, and there's now increasingly archival evidence to support this. It spurred another narrative, one that was uh, uh, in the background uh, up to that point anyhow, but then it really took off. And this was this narrative of Russia being opposed to the United States, uh, the narrative of opposition. Uh, because after all, you can find legitimacy, not just from being a partner, and this is the interesting thing about legitimacy and recognition, you can be recognized as a partner of the United States and be legitimized by the act of partnership with the United States, but you can also be legitimized by being an enemy of the United States, you can sell it to your domestic audience and you can sell actually we're standing up to the United States, and you can draw legitimacy from this and this is what happened in Russia increasingly even before Putin it happened under Yeltsin, under mid Yeltsin by Kosovo by 1999, this uh, trend was firmly entrenched. And of course, this is what we have under Putin today. So are we then living in another Cold War? My answer would be yes and no. On the yes side, the great power struggle is there. Uh, the powers have maybe changed, um, uh, but you know, nuclear weapons are still there. Uh, there's need still, as it was during the Cold War, for security and recognition. So there are lots of continuities. What is missing is the ideological framing. But the ideological framing, as I have tried to explain, does not by itself provide all the answers. Indeed, it often obscures, in my opinion, more than it illuminates. 
Okay, thank you very much. I know I ran over time, but I appreciate uh, Ezra not cutting me off, no, no, not, not shutting me down. <laughs> thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you so much, Sergey, for those those very insightful uh, reflections and you know really wide ranging from the the early days of the Cold War, from or even before Yalta to to the present. Um, so we've got we've got three or four questions that have come in on the on the chat and through the Q and A. And if you have other questions. Uh, please write them. Some of these questions are from our, I, I know are from my, my students in my, in our undergraduate uh, global cold war class that I'm now teaching. Uh, some others from our community members. Um, so the first question is, is a question from Zach Schramm um, about ideology. And I think, I think he's picking up on your, maybe your downplaying of ideology. So he's, he's asking it, whether there's something inherent in communism, or at least, you know, perhaps in Marxist Leninist uh, interpretations of communism that necessitates the need for mass cooperation and the use of state force to uphold mass governmental systems. And I, maybe I'll just sort of build on that and ask you whether you think there's anything in particular about Marxist-Leninism that is important for understanding Soviet foreign policy. You know, in this Jenga you're talking about, if, there, if, if, this, if this was replaced with another ideology, you know, what difference would it have, have made? Well, and, and that's, you know, that's the very difficult question. Uh, that's why I suspect there's going to be a lot of pushback against this sort of interpretation that I'm trying to advance here, because people say, well, it's just not credible. Uh, the Soviets were constructing communism, and communism uh, talks about the conflict between capitalism and communism, something inevitable. In other words, uh, you know, we will bury you, as Khrushchev had said, yeah, we will bury you. Therefore, there was no prospect for coexistence, even though it was Khrushchev himself who declared coexistence in 1956, um, which you, you might argue, you know, Cold War in a sense was, um, or the, the hist history ended, I would argue, in the 1950s, simply because both powers acquired nuclear weapons and both acquired means of destroying the other. So you could not resolve this, this problem by military means. And the Soviets recognized that. They recognized that under Khrushchev. They even recognized that under Stalin. This Stalin was trying to avoid a war. I don't think Stalin wanted a war. Um, he was afraid of uh, a conflict with the United States. Um, so uh, his thinking was really shaped by his uh, imperialist proclivities. And of course, it's not surprising. If you look at Soviet uh, uh, planning, uh, late Second World War planning for the future of the world, it's all about division of the world into sphere of, uh, spheres of influence. But is that surprising? I mean, when Churchill showed up in Moscow in October 1944 and wrote down his little piece of paper with percentages for different countries. That's exactly the kind of thinking that, you know, that, that the British had at that time, reflected the same sort of imperialist thinking. It's the American thinking that was quite different and quite new, this whole idea that you cannot, you should not be allowed to do that, you should not be allowed to divide the world into spheres of influence. So how does this idea of dividing the world into spheres of influence, uh, how does that actually align with communist ideology? And my answer to this would be that it doesn't align very well at all and often Soviet foreign policy contradicted what you would argue the communist foreign policy should have been, uh, but the Soviets actually acted out of realism, out of pragmatic considerations, out of maybe imperialist considerations, out of, consider out, out of desire to be recognized or legitimized, and used ideology more often than not as instrumental framing. So ideology was instrumentalized for the purpose, again, for the purpose of legitimate, legitimating uh, uh, their foreign policy. So it's kind of an interesting uh, in potentially self-contradictory argument that I will, uh, I will have to stick by uh, um, uh, and because, you know, and I realize it will cause a lot of, uh, a lot of um, pushback from defenders of ideology uh, because it's very important to uh, stress that since the Cold War studies blossomed, they kind of gone out of fashion as of late, which is strange given where we are at the moment. But the one they blossomed in the 1990s, ideology was really emphasized a lot by people uh, as the sort of driving force, as the key idea to understand the Cold War. And here what I'm saying is, well, actually, it's not ideology, it's legitimacy, which is a different concept. And the reason it's different because it's constructed differently and it comes from different sources. It doesn't mean that ideology is irrelevant. It's just ideology is not the only thing. Great, thank you. Um, we have two questions. I'm going to pair together. 
since they both uh, touch on China, Russia, sort of the Russian-China relationship, and also the U.S.-China relationship, and you know, one of the one of the really um, unique things I would say about Sergei's scholarship is uh, you're equally well versed in you know in the sort of Soviet and, and and American and also the Chinese sources and reading in Mandarin. Um, so the the two questions are one asks about Michael Thomas is asking about whether uh, about the space race and whether whether the U.S. is in a space race now with China. And then in the Q and A, uh, we have Anton Allen, who like you is a native of Sakhalin. Uh, and is wondering about what your opinion uh, is on China potentially turning Russia into a client state, uh, at least economically. Um, and uh, they're wondering whether China would like to pull off a Crimean annexation type of event on the Russian Far East. So, so question about the sort of U.S. U.S. China relationship in space, and also the the Russian China relationship uh, in the Russian Far East. Sure, sure. Uh, those are really great questions. Uh, with regard to um, Michael's questions about space, um, uh, obviously space race was a uh, was an important part of the of the Cold War, um, and and the reason it was an important part of the Cold War is because generally this is you know uh, uh, historians argue that it allowed the two sides to show the superiority of their systems, which is an ideological way of framing the question. So the system is an ideological construct, as it were. Uh, uh, which is fair enough. You know, my approach to this would be to say that it was, uh, yes, it was very much about prestige. It was very much about legitimacy because if you're able to send somebody or something into space that shows that you are, you know, the whole world can recognize you as legitimate. That is what the Soviets drew from that Sputnik moment on October 4th, 1957, when that little thing went around the world and everybody was looking in America, everybody was looking, oh, look at this magic, you know, <laughs> in the skies. Um, that doesn't that speak, you know, this speaks for itself, as it were. Uh, it shows the world what is superior, and the Soviet Union is superior and therefore legitimate. That's that that's the you know, that's where legitimacy comes in, the argument that I would make. By the way, in, in China's case, Mao Zedong was also quite an impressed the Chinese leader Mao Zedong by the phenomenon of Sputnik. That is why when Mao Zedong launched the Great Loop Forward in 1957, he uh, launched those uh, great communes, brought hundreds of thousands of peasants into this massive communes. And one of the first communes was called the Sputnik commune because he wanted to impress the world with this new social creation the commune, which turned out to be a massive disaster and millions and tens of millions of people died in China as a result. But the, the idea there was, again, it was a struggle for prestige. It was a struggle uh, for recognition as, uh, as, as the leader, struggle for leadership more than anything else. So yes, this frame, you know, this can be framed ideologically, but also just in terms of struggle for leadership. And today, uh, even though the communist ideology uh, is probably you know widely discredited, and uh, nobody would claim that China is a communist country except for the fact that it, you know it's still called it's still run by so-called communist party, <laughs> which is a small uh, well maybe not such a small issue. But anyway, so yeah, China is competing with the United States in all kinds of technologies, including space technology, but also AI, supercomputers, uh, uh, robotics, uh, and uh, etc. And this is done not just because it's important for the countries. Uh, security, uh, its economic prosperity, but also because it's important for the country's prestige and recognition. So every time the Chinese, like they recently sent a rover to Mars, that gave China recognition that it's out there, that it's one of the two, because who else sent a rover to Mars? The United States, not Britain, not Australia, you know, but those countries. So there we go. That's, uh, I, th I think if, if this answer, I think this answers your question. Um, uh, the second question uh, is from Anton, yeah? Was it Anton? I yes, cannot, Anton. I, cannot, but, so I, I heard um, uh, Eric, the question as you sort of presented it. And my take on this is as follows. Um, uh, I don't think there's, a, first of all, just to deal with this head on, as it were, at the moment, I don't think there's any danger of, of China's expansion into Siberia. Um, uh, and the, and the, the reason for this is pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, conditions in China are actually much better than they are in Siberia uh, for an average 
Chinese work or peasant. That's why they don't want to go to Russia. Uh, 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 you know, anecdotal you know evidence. So one time I raised this question with a, a Chinese friend of mine. He said, "Why would we want to call on our? Why, why would we want to go to Siberia when we can go to Vancouver? You know, much better life there." <laughs> So, um, uh, but uh, to be, you know, but to make it to to create a kind of broad, and also there's no evidence really for any kind of Chinese expansionism, although there's been some complaints about Chinese economic activities in some parts of the Russian Far East and Siberia. Um, but this is not so much even because of any kind of Chinese expansionism, it's just because of the uh, problems with local administration and how uh, there's lack of rules and lack of enforcement, a lot of corruption. So it's really Russia's problem more than it's even China's problem. But in broader terms about the Russian-Chinese relationship, um, there is an interesting theory in the United States that's very popular in Washington at the moment, and that is that the United States should focus on containing China or struggling against China, therefore it should go easy on Russia in the hope that this will pull Russia away from China. I think this is actually a misconstrued. This whole idea is actually misconstrued. Russia and China have had a very complicated relationship for centuries. They go back to the 17th century. In uh, recent decades, they have had a vicious confrontation, such as their clash along the border, their Damansky or Chen Baodao in 1969, which you could argue brought the two countries to the verge of, a, of an open conflict that was they fought an undeclared war. Uh, and then they had a period of very tense confrontation in the 70s until relations started to improve in the 1980s. I think that left a, a, a particular legacy for both the Chinese and the Russian policymakers and political elites. They recognize that it's important to maintain a positive relationship with one another and not allow third countries to play on this relationship and exploit their contradictions. If I, you know, I'm very anti-Putin in many ways. I, I don't support Putin's regime in any kind, in any conceivable way. But if I were, you know, uh, asked to run Russian foreign policy, uh, as a very you know, liberal intellectual, I would seek improvement of relations with China and you know very stable, very good relationship with China. This is the insensible thing to do for Russia. It's, it shares a gigantic border with China, and it should have a very, very good economic relationship because there is an economic backbone, important economic backbone to this relationship, but also a political relationship. There's no reason to quarrel with the Chinese. So I think it's 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 uh, um, uh, first of all, I don't think it, the rhetoric of you know china some kind of invasion and penetration is, is playing out the chinese are playing it very carefully even with the sdi uh the silken road initiative into central asia where they the, the russians fear that they the chinese would be stepping on their feet the chinese have been very careful and have been trying to deconflict their relationship but this is not to say that russia and china are going to grow into some kind of close embrace and two military alliance both sides are slightly wary of one another and they also understand that having a close alliance is actually not in the interest of either side because it constrains both sides it doesn't give them enough space for action so the russians have their own interests in crimea the chinese don't recognize the annexation by the way they have their interest in 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 the middle east the chinese may have different interests of their own you know the chinese have their interest in south china sea does russia want to get embroiled in a conflict there or does russia want to get embroiled in a conflict between china and the united states no no they want to keep <laughs> keep that keep china far away so they're working closely together they're trying to avoid conflict but there's no uh, there's no real prospect either for this to explode into some kind of hideous rivalry or confrontation, nor is there a prospect for a close uh, alliance like they had in the 1950s. Good, thank you. Uh, we just have a couple of minutes left, and I, I wanted to ask you, you know, in hearing about your argument about legitimacy, I mean, that's something I, I've really seen in my own research, how important that is and how much of a driving factor that is and how these Soviet leaders are, are, you know, really craving legitimacy. And I think, you know, there's something to be said for your argument that, you know, there is a systemic factor there that the U.S. as a superpower is the only one that can bestow, you know, superpower legitimacy. But I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how important, uh, you know, some longer term trends in Russian history are for you. I mean, there's certainly, you know, going back at least to Peter, Peter the Great, you know, there is this looking to the West as the model for you know for for you know what is developed, what is what is considered um, 
you know, sort of the established, the established nations, the great powers, and then, you know, this carries forward in, in various ways. And there's also this, the Soviet conception of the West as, as more economically advanced, certainly in certain, in certain ways. And um, I'm wondering how, how important is, is a longer term relationship between Russia and, you know, quote unquote, the West, which is, which is largely a West that Russia constructs for itself in some ways. Um, how important is, is that? Ari, this is a great question because, you know, through, despite the Cold War rivalry and confrontation, the Russians and the Soviets define themselves as Europeans. They always did. Um, uh, cannot say that much about Stalin. I haven't seen him on the record talking about that. But certainly Khrushchev, certainly Brezhnev. Brezhnev would say things like, I'm European. We're Europeans. We want to be, you know, that's why he was interested in developing a close relationship with European countries like West Germany and France and, of course, the United States, which he recognized as a European country in Brezhnev's imagination. That, that's how it worked. European, in contrast to Asia, which Brezhnev said he never understood. He really criticized Mao Zedong, said you cannot trust the Chinese. They're so hideous, etc. You just cannot do anything with them. By contrast, you can understand the Europeans because we are also European. European. Now, now you can accuse Brezhnev of being a racist. Of course, in many ways he was. He was the person of his times, and so was Khrushchev, who also allowed himself himself uh, fairly racist comments against uh, China and Asia in general. Um, uh, Gorbachev also talked about uh, being European, and of course, Gorbachev famously promoted the idea of a common European home, uh, where the Soviet Union would be a key member, as it were. Uh, so, but there's a, there's an interesting contradiction there. At one level, the Soviet Union wanted to be accepted as a European power. On at another level, they also wanted to define what Europe is or to really exercise great power in Europe itself, which is why in the context of, let's say, European integration, the Soviet Union and later Russia were always seen uh, with suspicion. The Germans didn't have, didn't want to have any part of that. The French had their own problems. They didn't want to have Russia on board, even though de Gaulle, of course, famously talked about Europe from the Atlantic to, to the Urals. And of course, the Russians also wanted to push the Americans out of Europe uh, throughout this period, and they still hope that NATO will fall apart and the Americans will go home because Europe should be left to Europeans and to Russia, which then could play a more assertive role and, and, and be accepted as a European power. So that is, I think, where the Russian identity is, as far as identity goes. Now, it is true that most of Russia is in, in Siberia, it's the, you know, the Asian landmass, but you see very few of Russian intellectuals, with the exception of some French figures. Not only, okay, I can say Sergei Karaganov, who's a kind of a leading uh, a guy who's close to policy theorizing, as it were, and, you know, fairly, I won't say he's close to Putin, but he sort of positions himself as this person who, uh, the Russia's Kissinger, as it were, but he talks about Russia uh, needing to find its own identity almost in opposition to the West and uh, turn inwards or turn to Siberia, turn to Asia. But I think this kind of, um, uh, 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 this, this kind of position is, um, is punditry more than anything else. I don't think for, I don't think Karaganov even believes in it himself. I think Karaganov is as European as anybody else. And even me, you know, I am an Asian Russian. That is to say, I was born in the town of Lysozavodsk on the border with China. I grew up in Sakhalin. Um, do I consider myself some kind of, you know, Asian? No, really, you know, culturally, of course, I, I'm kind of European. Um, uh, and, and this identity is still firmly even with me, and I carry it. And in this regard, I think I share it with the rest, uh, with many, many, many other Russians. Great, thank you so much. We are we are out of time, uh, but uh, I want to uh, really thank Sergei for a great presentation. And uh, next time, we'll hope to bring him in person back to Kansas. Uh, and 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 take him uh, around campus and also to to some of the local uh, Cold War sites around here. Uh, but thank you everyone for for joining us. We had great attendance today, and uh, thank you Sergey for your talk. Uh, the talk will be will be posted on online when when it's uh, when it's ready. And uh, hope to see you all at our at our upcoming events uh, later this this fall. Thank you, Sergey. Thank you, Eric. Really appreciate it.